Hello and welcome to A Celtic World, the YouTube channel and podcast that connects Celtic fans all over the planet. From Dunfermline to Derry, Glen Coe to Glen Avon. Wherever you are watching, you're part of A Celtic World. And I'm joined today by the familiar faces of Stephen in Sydney and Paul in Perth. But let's not bury the lead. It gives me great pleasure to say, Paddy McCord, welcome to A Celtic World. Cheers, Gareth. Thanks very much. Hope you're doing well. Doing very well indeed. And you're in lovely Donegal. How are things there? Aye, wet as normal. Um, <laughs> I think we had a dry day there about six months ago, but I thought it you know, could be longer. Okay, Paul, Stephen, do you want to say hello to Paddy? Paddy, how you doing? Hey, um, Paddy, we've how you doing it. A wee bit warmer for us boys, one on each coast of Australia. I know. Listen, we've we've had a year of rain, unfortunately. Even last summer, I, I'm sure you probably talked to plenty of Irish people. There was um, the the summer was just non-existent. Hey? It was every day waking up the rain. So with fingers crossed, this year, this year, will be a wee bit better. Absolutely. Good stuff. Summer in Ireland's like my favourite day of the year. That's what they say. But. <laughs> uh, all right, so there's a few people in the comments, even though this was quite short notice. If you can tell us if anyone's volume needs adjusting, we'll do that. Uh, otherwise, we'll just crack on with chatting to Paddy. Now, you're doing a few of these, Paddy, aren't you? Talking to various people. so, And they're all asking you about your highlights as a Celtic player and all that stuff. So we'll try and cover a little bit of different ground, if that's all right with you. Yes, maybe, no worries. Just a bit left field. So let's start off with... The big question on everyone's lips. The TV show Derry Girls. Absolutely hilarious or funny as a boot in the balls? Oh, I was a big fan, Gab, I have to say now. Who are you? Uh, the, uh, especially, especially the early ones, you know, mm -hmm. because it was so new. And, like, although I wasn't a Derry girl, I was a Derry boy, there was a, a lot of it you could relate to, you know, back, you know, sure. back of... Of certain scenes and you know obviously I had three older sisters so you know they were constantly talking about it you know about gee that was exactly like it was back then and and, and stuff like that so no I, I have to say I find it very funny now. yeah I mean I'm delighted for its success you know because it's great for dairy it's great for the area it's great for all the people involved you know uh, but I have to say I struggle to to sit through it myself Paul, you a fan? Look, I, I passed me by a bit. I um, I watched a bunch of bits and pieces of it. I thought Tommy Tiernan was very funny in it um, as the dad, but um, I'll be honest, I'm I'm not a diehard. I haven't I haven't seen it all. So uh, yeah, probably uh, move on from that. For me. <laughs> well, loads of people love it, and they're always saying to me, like I'm from Belfast, Paddy, and they're always saying, "Oh, there he goes." That's that's your part of the world, isn't it? Oh, it's brilliant, isn't it? Uh, uh, all right. <laughs> well, do you know, I'll, I'll tell you what was funny. Whatever way, you know, the, the girl done it, Lisa McGee, and, and the characters that she put on the show, if you were speaking the most girls that grew up around that time, they would nearly say, I had a friend like her, and I had, a, you know, it was incredible how she characterised the, you know, the characters in it, because, you know, it, it, it did hit home with a lot of girls that grew up around them times, you know, and it was amazing how many people that could actually reference one of their own friends that was just like one of the characters in the show. Yeah, I know a lot of it was very relatable. A lot of it was brilliantly done. But uh, Monty's a fan. There you go. He loves the <laughs> I think he means the show. <laughs> oh, as Porkchop says, Monty, you love any girls, mate. Very good. <laughs> No, it was, okay. listen, I think regardless of how any of us were thought of it, you know, it was a, it went, it went massive and, sure. you know, all the people involved in it has went on, they have, you know, great success. A lot of them went on, they have all our good roles and all our shows. So, you know, I don't think anyone can argue how well the show done. Massive success worldwide. Put Derry on the map for a lot of people. So, all right. That, all right well, that, that's good. All right. So. Paul, you wanted to jump in with a quick question that brings us more up to the modern day. 
Yeah, but a party, I just thought I'd um, a bit remiss if two Scottish guys and two guys from the North Island, we don't touch on the match last night. Um, us down in Australia probably didn't get a great chance to see it, but a uh, little bit of a shock um, that Scotland getting beat. I just wondered what your thoughts were on, on the game itself and, and maybe more broadly on Scotland's chances at the Euros. Uh, look, if you, if you look on how, you know, I know Scotland have a one on seven now, isn't it? It was last night's yeah, seven. Poor run. But, yeah, poor run. You know, the, their, their form over the past two years has been very good, you know, maybe two and a half. Um, qualified for the Euros quite comfortably, I thought, you know, in a decent group. And I think Northern Ireland's form has been quite poor, you know, since Michael's back now 12 months. Um, it's a young squad. He, he's probably still finding out about it. But the one thing Michael's excellent at, you know, and I've worked under him, is setting up a team to be hard to beat, you know, now, I watched the Republic of Ireland game last night. I didn't, I didn't see the Scotland game. But when I looked at the stats after the game, Scotland had all the ball. They had 10 or, 10 or 11 shots at goal, not many on target. So I know without seeing the game exactly what way the game went. You know, Michael would have played a 3-5-1-1, you know, difficult to beat, um, solid. And, you know, Scotland probably found it hard to break them down now. In the Euros, I think that's going to be different because they're probably going to be underdogs in most games, you know, certainly if they manage to get out of the group. So they'll be coming up against a different test. But I don't think Scotland playing against, you know, a, a low block way, you know, plenty of bodies in the middle of the pitch is going to be to their strengths. But listen, if they can get a if they can get a, a full squad available for the Euros and all their all their top players hitting a bit of form at the right time. I don't see how they, you know, can't go and be successful there. Do you think they're going to want it? No, I don't think they're going to want it. Definitely not, because I just think the other teams in Europe are just too strong at the minute. But, you know, they could go and cause an upset and definitely have a positive turn. That's just about, yeah, look, that's where I am. Even though I'm saying I didn't see the game, it was on at silly o'clock for, for us down here. But um, that's what it sounds like. It sounds like, the you know, Scotland for the majority, but no cutting edge, which... We're blessed with tons of midfielders and fullbacks, but we're probably a bit ropey up top and, and centre back, maybe. So um fingers crossed we can pull it all together and as you say, get players back for, for the Euros because obviously we're missing a few key players. No, I, I agree. I agree certainly with the you know the centre forward situation. Um I'm not sure if the lad Che Adams was available, he might have missed the squad, but you know, um the other option seems to be the lad London Dykes who you know, it's done. It's done quite well for Scotland in certain games. But if you're, um, you know, if you're wanting to go to a major tournament like that and and do well, then you know, in my opinion, you would need to have a, a top top centre forward or at least one that's you know playing in the top league week in week out and performing well and scoring goals. Now, unfortunately for for Dykes, he's, he's gone down the the QPR. And, I don't think it's it's a club that's been going quite well for a long time. So maybe his forms dipped at club level because of that. But you know, I certainly agree in terms of the, the sort of attacking areas that you know we probably need a wee bit more to, to be going on the tournament thinking you could you could actually want it. Yeah, well, thanks for seven. for Scotland. Yeah, oh, thanks for seventy minutes and Adams came on and Chankman played I think 10, 12 minutes. So Shankland's probably the best of the lot in terms of form, but we'll we'll see how we roll up when it comes to the tournament. Well, definitely, like I said, you know, as I say, you can't you can't argue with his form so this this season. I think he's 25, 26 goals for Hearts, but you know, whether whether Steve Clark sees him as his number nine, at time will tell. Okay, uh, I was going to say fingers crossed for Scotland, and fingers crossed that my internet connection remains because. Just in time for this, Paddy, apparently some people have been stealing cables from the ground near my house and the whole area has no internet. So I'm on my phone hotspot. And you thought you'd get out of Belfast too? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) It wasn't me. It wasn't me. Uh, But uh, if I disappear, if there's problems, let me know. I might have to follow my sword, in which case Stephen will take over. But Stephen, you've got... First question you want to put to uh, Paddy about his career? Yeah, yeah, Paddy. Obviously, you've uh, you've played in quite a number of leagues 
down through the years, you've played in the SPL, SPFL, you played in the League of Ireland, you played in the Northern Irish League, as well as the Championship League 1 and 2 in England. The first part of my question is, how do you think the SPL or the SPFL stacks up against the two Irish leagues in terms of standard, particularly outside of Celtic and Rangers? And do you think the standard over there is improving? It is. Um, the League of Ireland especially, and more recently the Irish League, have had a lot of investment on it. Um, so the top teams are are getting, you know, a lot better. Um, players are players are staying in the league longer because, you know, the finances are much better than maybe 10 years ago where if you wanted they, they you know, earn a decent amount of money without being in the Premier League or the Championship in England, then a lot of players would have chose the, the SPFL route. You know, they, 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 they maybe get a better wage. But, you know, certainly the likes of Shamrock Rovers and even Derry City to a certain degree at the minute can, you know, can offer good wages, which is seeing a better calibre of player, coming to the league firstly and then also staying in it. So, look, outside of Celtic and Rangers, if you look at the, the games in Europe recently, like Mullerwell, Mullerwell were knocked out by Sligo, was it not last year, the year before, over two legs? Yep. Now, yeah, they were, yeah. We, we, we no disrespect to Sligo. Sligo aren't the top team in the League of Ireland. You know, they're predominantly around the bottom five recently. So, you know, I think in any given day, one, you know, over a two leg, over a two leg European tie, any of the top League of Ireland clubs would give, you know, anyone outside of Celtic and Rangers a decent tie. It would be, in my opinion, a 50 50 call who would come out in the end. Um, Irish League, uh, the Irish League clubs have also spent a lot of money. You have Lauren, who's a big investor in Kenny Bruce, um, Lanfield, Glen Torn, um, Corain have a recent investment from America. And you've also got Crusaders that have, you know, been fairly successful over a long period of time and had a couple of good, a couple of good um, stunts in Europe. The one who who I mentioned last, who doesn't seem to have any big investment, and keeps punching above their weight is Cliftonville. You know, again, they're sitting in the top three, so you know they're doing a fantastic job. Jim Majelton and Jared Little there because they don't, and I know this for a fact, pay the same wages as. The likes of Alarn, Longfield, and Glen Thorne, not even anywhere near it. But again, any of them clubs recently who've invested heavily, if they were to draw most of the SPFL clubs in a, in a European tie, I think it'll be very close over the two legs. And then being involved in the being involved in the youth development over there now, do you think Celtic are active enough in that space? Obviously, we've got Liam Scales playing in the first team just now. Do you think we could be doing more? I think there's more um, undiscovered gems in, in in both the Irish leagues. There's certainly talent in Ireland. Um, since Brexit has come in, there's a lot of there's a lot more interest here. You know, from the UK clubs, especially. So I think that's made it harder for Celtic in terms of trying to get you know the real the real best underage ones. Because if you look recently, Chelsea are, are back looking here. Liverpool have taken a couple. Uh, Man United, in fairness, have always you know had a high interest in in Ireland. But you know that makes it difficult for Celtic because when these big clubs call and you know they're willing to really put their hand in their pocket for young players, you know it's hard to it's hard to compete with. Um, I know Celtic have a good scouting system here. They have Matt Bradley. And an our fella, uh, Paddy Crowley, who you know that they they work hard. You see them at matches constantly, and all they can do really is flag the players up, you know, and and and, and say, look, this is one I think we should be targeting. The problem you have then is FIFA brought in new rules that players can only visit two clubs per calendar year. So if you're if you're not one of them two clubs so if you're competing with a man united and a chelsea or a liverpool man united and the boy choose chooses to visit them two clubs it, it's very difficult they 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 try and get a player to commit the sign if you if you can't even get him on a trial so it's not as easy as what people think that's how i'll sum it up and you have a brother leroy who's been very successful scout 
for Brighton. Isn't that right, Paddy? That's right, yeah. My brother, uh, Leroy's worked for Brighton for eight years. So he's he's been able to identify a lot of talent and you know, he's been very successful with the players he sent across. Um, again, you know, like Matt Bradley, works very hard up and down the country, identifying the, the best talents. And I think in Leroy's case, you know, he, he was helped a lot by how well Brighton have improved over the last sort of four or five years as a club, you know, establishing themselves as a Premier League club. And, you know, as I say, when you have an Evan Ferguson or an Andy Moran come along, well, and they, you know, trust the scout and, you know, really go and, and heavily invest and, and trying to get the best young players because, like, clubs have to now with, with Brexit because it's so much harder now to get a top European young player. Is Leroy his real name? And how did he get the name Leroy? That's his real name. And believe it or not, his actual second name is Saul and... My mother doesn't even drink, so we can't blame a drink. I don't know what was she was going through at that time. <laughs> I mean, the only Leroy I knew when we were young was the guy from Fame. You remember the yeah. TV show Fame? We're all, maybe I, I, to be honest, party. yeah, we're, we're all afraid they asked her because, you know, there was a lot of <laughs> boat stocking and dairy at that time, you know what I mean? <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> dear, oh dear. That was the boy in favourite. Right. Used to wear those really tight pants as well. So <laughs> he was a good dancer. Ah. Maybe is that where you get your Very dancing dancer, skills? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let's move it on. Uh, I wanted to ask you uh, about Northern Ireland, but your decision to play for Northern Ireland, like in your mind, was it a choice between the north and the south? Or talk talk me through that because lots of players, you know, elect to make a different choice and what was the impact of your choice? Um, well, I, I was playing for Ratsdale at the time and my first call up, the, the Northern Ireland squad was, it was a, like a, a challenge match that was being played at Macclesfield and Sammy McElroy was the manager. And I had just started to break through the sort of Ratsdale first team. And I got a call up to that match and it was like a mixture of under 18s to under 21s and a few sort of first team players that were playing around the northwest of England at the time. And Sammy McElroy was manager who got, was a was a superstar back in his day. And I'm sure any Man United fans would, would tell you that from the sort of 60s and 70s. Um, now, I was a bit starstruck, you know, and, and I went on to have a really good game. And, and since that game, Sammy McElroy made a real interest in, in, in myself and, you know, would always keep in touch and would come along to the games at right there, would always stay behind for a chat after. And then I started to make the, a couple of 21 squads and then he brought me into a few first-team squads. Now, I had only played a friendly or two up until then. And then... Republic of Ireland made their interest known to come under the 21s. But at that stage, I had real, I had a real sort of relationship with Sammy McElroy. And as I say, I was getting under a few first team squads. I had made my debut. And I seen it as a sort of backward step for my career. They, they jumped from first team back to 21. So I ended up, I stuck with Northern Ireland, probably because of Sammy McElroy more than anything. And look, I had no regrets. I, I really enjoyed playing for Northern Ireland then throughout my career. Yeah. Sammy McElroy was one of the first footballers I became aware of as a kid, you know. He was brilliant, as you say. Did you get a lot of abuse, though, for, for from people for choosing Northern Ireland? I never got any abuse. I have to say that, you know, right, right through my career. Um, we had the... Uh, we had the incident where myself, Neil Lennon and Niall McGinn was sent bullets in the post after mm. after a Rangers game around New Year one time, but there was never anything to suggest that that came from Northern Ireland fans. You know, people I think the press try to I think the press try to sort of portray it like that because, you know, remember it happened to, to Lenny before the time he was to be named captain. But there was never any evidence to suggest it was and nor did I ever feel that I wasn't wanted at Northern Ireland, or nor did anyone ever tell no. me. So, 
you know, I have to admit and I have to say this, I never ever had any grief, you know, from Northern Ireland fans. Maybe Northern Ireland supporting Rangers fans, you know, that, that's yeah. different. But certainly not for turning up and playing for Northern Ireland. Because like Windsor Park, you know, to me, I've, I think I was only ever there once for a Northern Ireland game. And, uh, you know, I, I felt nervous going in there, you know, because it's Windsor Park and didn't feel like home. And, uh, well, listen, I was, but, I, I, but I think yeah, if you'll be the first to admit that's probably a consequence in the era that you grew up, you know. Yeah, well, I you hope know, so. I hope it's very different these days. Uh, you know, and, and again, a lot of the fear you had was a fear of the unknown because you wouldn't have been across that part of the city, let's be honest. You know, mm. only only football would have take, taken you over there. Now, when I was playing, like we, my family used to run a bus up with maybe 30 people on it. Never any incidents, you know, tickets were all sorted. End of the game, back on the bus and down the road. But look, there was there was certainly in the the sort of eighties and, and early nineties, you know, this this sort of feeling that, you know, uh, you know, you, you don't go to Windsor Park, you don't go to watch an Anfield game, you wouldn't go to watch an Northern Ireland game. But, you know, I think I think the M days have long improved since then. I hope so, because we were schoolboys, like I was there with my brother, and uh, we were like in this big crowd of fans, and a friend of his from school spotted my brother, my brother's name's Cormac, which is obviously the kind of name you'd only get on one side of the aisle, and yeah. this fellow starts shouting, Cormac, Cormac, and everyone's <laughs> looking around going, Cormac, Cormac, so, so we started doing the same, going, where is this Cormac? <laughs> What's he doing? That was the day. That was them. the day you lost your brother, Gav, and you started on the way off. <laughs> Just pointed at him and ran off. That's what happened. <laughs> so, uh, well, I'm glad. I, I, I'm sure things have changed a lot since then. And uh, has it has it been a while, Gav, since you were back, or have you been over there? A long well, time? I, I haven't lived there since I was 18, so you know, uh, that was a long time ago. And uh, yeah, I haven't been back to. Uh, uh, huh? I said you said it was a long time ago. I said clearly. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah i mean i haven't been back to windsor park I, I think it's all totally different i was just looking at pictures of it there online you know the stadium itself seems to have changed massively from back then i, I to be honest i haven't been up myself in a few years um the last game i was at was probably about five six years ago but no listen it's like everything you would like to think in the country you know it's moved on a long way and you know sports no different yeah, well, I'm glad to hear the fans didn't give you any grief. You know, well, uh, you would have thought that Paddy the Dairy Pele tearing it up at Windsor Park was maybe something they had to sort of grit their teeth and bear rather than rejoicing, you know? Ah, who knows? Okay. So, um, Stephen, do you want to jump in now with a question? You're up next. Yeah, Paddy. You've obviously uh, played under a load of really good managers, including Gordon Strachan at Celtic. Um, who do you think was the, the the best manager who you played under during your career, and the one who influenced your your development the most? Um, for me personally, now I'm not saying he's the best manager that I've ever worked under, and he's better than all the ones that I, I worked under. For me personally, I found that the best football I played under was Stephen Kenny, who has most recently been the Republic of Ireland manager. Um, Stephen was was great for you know giving players confidence and you know making them feel that you know they're a good player. And and, and me and my personality, I, I really took to that style of management. And I found you know the years playing under him at Derry City was. The years where I felt that I was, you know, playing my best football and was going on to the field, you know, most confident and and I fact look the fact that I was younger too, working under him helped. Um, because then, you know, when you're a bit older, you're playing under I, I, I didn't play under Gordon that often, being honest. I, that was my first year. I had spent most of that in the reserves. Then Tony Mowbray came on for a short period. Uh, the team obviously didn't have a, a, a great uh eight, nine months under him. And then the last three and a half years was was under Neil Lennon, which I had my best time at Celtic. Now, Lenny was completely different to Stephen. You know, Lenny was, you know, a bit old school and, 
you know, you had to be a man and you had to stand up. And if he saw him, they say, he, you know, you were getting it. Like, so you had to grow up quite quickly playing under Lenny, you know, even though I was only still 24, 25 at the time. But just different managers of different styles. People say this manager's a great manager and this manager's a bad manager. To be honest, I think a lot of it depends on, depends on the, the player's personality. Certain managers should certain players and, and other ones don't. And throughout my career, I've seen that happen with so many players where they had a, a personality class with a manager or didn't like his style, moved on to an R one and, and, and thrived under him. And, you know, it's just personalities, you know, and, and I think that's a big thing in life in general. You know, even in, in everyday work, if a boss doesn't get on with one of his employees, it's very hard. They, they bite the bullet and get on with it. You know, sometimes you're better just, you know, hand on your resignation and moving on somewhere else because not a lot of time does it ever fix itself. And football's no different, players and managers. Stephen Kenny wrote you a letter, didn't he? Once to, to sort of try and give you his best advice for how you can get on in your career. Tell us about that. He did. It was it was when I was younger. I was about twenty one. I just signed for Derry, and uh, and truth be told, Gav, I was running about a, a bit. You know, I hadn't been back living in Derry for about four or five years. So I was maybe finishing the match. Play Friday nights in Ireland, DC. So I was maybe finishing the match on a Friday night, going out on a Friday night, maybe going out on a Saturday night, and then you know we trained on a Sunday. And I think Stephen was either getting wind of it from me or he was certainly getting told, you know, from people that, you know, Jesus, Paddy's been out about there, blah, blah, blah. And instead of pulling me in and reading me the riot act, he, he wrote me like a, a three or four page letter about, you know, if you could, um, you know, make small changes to your game and your lifestyle and, and whatever else that, you know, I believe you could be, you know, go on to be this player and could play at this level. And, you know, I think reading it off a page, you know, it, 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 it certainly made me it certainly made me think and, and hit home and you know that coincided with my wife getting pregnant my now wife which was girlfriend at the time getting pregnant and we had our first child so the letter mixed in with that you know certainly made me take stock of you know what I was doing away from the pitch and you know thankfully over the next couple of years I was able to get the head down and then earn the move to Celtic again Fantastic. Just on yes. the back of that as well, right. Paddy, what, 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 what's your opinion of Brendan Rodgers as a manager? Because his opinion at the moment is probably quite divided among the Celtic support. Um, do, you, do, you, do you think Brendan Rodgers is a truly elite manager, like what, like a lot of Celtic fans believe he is? Um, I think I think his first spell in charge, you know, apart from, apart from how he left, you know, which left a sour test and a lot of supporters might... I think the quality of football was very good and obviously the amount of titles that we won were good. Now, there was a few shocker European results in there, you know, which could be pointed towards that, you know, Brendan maybe believed in the players too much and didn't want to change his style going on against PSG or Barcelona. Look, some people would commend that. Some people would say it's a bit naive. Now, the second spell, being honest, so far has been a wee bit underwhelming in terms of performance levels throughout the season. I think we're fortunate that we're, you know, still in the, in the title race. And I still think we're, we're fortunate that if we put out our best 11, I still think it's comfortably the best 11 in the division. And, and hopefully between now and then, I'm not sure how Callum is and, and Atate in terms of how long they're going to be out for. But certainly if we can get them two back, um, between now and the end of the season for most of the games. I don't see no reason why we can't go on and win the league, but I'm sure there will be, you know, big meetings at the end of the year of who's good enough in this squad and, and who do we let go because I don't think Brendan is the type of manager who's going to carry a lot of players that he doesn't feel good enough. You know, he's came back to the club, in my opinion, with assurances that there's going to be finances made available to sign quality players. So I would assume that would be the case in the summer because, you know, if we look at January's window, it was, again, underwhelming with the, the, the business that we've done. 
Uh, underwhelming is the key word. Uh, can I just check with you, Patty? Did you say we've got you till 20 past? Just need to manage our time here. Uh, what time is it now? It's five past. Uh, about quarter past, yeah, but that's all right. Just need to pick a wee man up from the nursery. Okay, 10 more minutes. Well, Paul has been very patient. I think we've got to give him a chance to jump in. Paul, do you want to do your little segment we'll do, now, yeah let's or? do a little fun segment so party this is a bit this is a bit silly but i thought i'd do this this is um do you, you're probably just maybe just about old enough to remember shoot magazine and match magazine do you remember those uh from from your childhood i do surely i yeah so the used, used to be these little, little so paul mcstay was my hero growing up i don't know if if he was if he was one of your favorites but they used to do these kind of things these little kind of quick questions so i'm not going to pull too many straight off of this but i just want to do a couple of questions in that kind of style so i'll do a couple of football related and a couple of not so uh, we'll start with just quick fire this whatever comes into your head we're looking for um best celtic player you played with best celtic i played sorry best celtic player i played with um probably not the most talented but Certainly the best would be Scott Brown in terms of what he brought to the dressing room, what he brought the training every day, um, what he brought as a person. You know, I'm not sure if any have ever met him or, or spoke to people you know him, but honestly, one of the nicest person people you'll ever meet in your life would, would do anything for anybody. Um, and then, look, crosses a white line and, and turns on the warrior that, you know, would would step on his own granny's throat to, to get three points in a game. So had an unbelievable balance of, you know, they they be good fun, be a good person. And then as soon as he stepped over the white line, then he knew that he was going to war and, you know, what it took and what it meant to play for a football club and especially captain it. Great stuff. Yeah, Bruni, obviously a club legend. Um, and then maybe your favourite Celtic player of all time that you didn't play with? Well, I did play with him once in a, in a, in a charity game, which is obviously Henrik Larsson. Uh, boring answer, but you know, any other answer is just wrong, in my opinion. Um, coming up through the, the 90s, you know, watching him. And again, I was doing a podcast the other day, and I, I do feel that that generation of supporters are so lucky they, they have had Henrik for so long because in this day and age, and I know he had offers to go to bigger clubs and turn them down, but with the money available now, if we ever had a player of that calibre again, it would just be too head turning. And, you know, we'd be lucky if we, you know, we had him for two or three seasons. So they have him for as long as we had and get over 300, and, was it 30 games and 216 goals or, or something like that. So, you know, just, a, just an incredible player. and. They especially have the, the, the career he had after such a horrific injury as well, you know, and, and uh, you know, so boring answer, but, you know, definitely, you know, the king of kings, Henrik Larsson. Nice to have played with him even in a bounce game, though. That's a, that's a claim. It was, uh, sure. honestly, I was, I was a wee bit starstruck even just getting changed beside him in the change room, you know, even just being in his presence because I, I'd only seen him maybe once or twice briefly before that he, he called on the Lennox town one time to see Lenny for something but he had he didn't stay around long so he spent the evening and the and the day with him was was special definitely awesome um next one probably i'll just this will be my last on this but just uh, more of the kind of the, the, the questions in the magazines um music favorite band or or singer or artist or you know kind of music you into i'm not I'm not mad on the, the music or bands or anything like that. What I do, like, I like certain songs, you know, so if I hear a song, I, I like it and, and stuff like that. But, you know, I'm, I'm not a concert goer or anything like that. My wife, believe it or not, loves them and, and, and I, I'm, not, I'm not into them. So it's a topic of conversation that, that's never really brought up. Um, no, I have to say, not a, not a huge music fan. If, well, even though you look uh, like a rock star in this, look at that. <laughs> well, Gav's a music man, and well, we're, we all like a bit of music, but Gav's our main music man, and uh, you know, I'm not sure if he's got a planned tribute song at some point, but that's uh, that's maybe for a, that's maybe for a, another day. Um, that's me, Gav. I'll we'll give him a short on time. I'll, I'll sort of leave it there. Cheers, buddy. No problem. Okay, well, we've only got five minutes left. I'm not sure we've got time to get into those big questions we had, Stephen. 
Uh, yeah, just, maybe just, try and just get one, the first maybe, game. maybe a quick one, Paddy. Um, obviously, you were a player who, who loved to, to get the ball at your feet and go past players uh, with a bit of dribbling, a bit of skill. Do you think that's a dying art in today's modern game, uh, given what, you know the, the, the prevalence of wingers playing on the wrong side, cutting back into their stronger foot? Uh, and the emphasis placed on pace and power instead of skill. Do you think the wing at a wing plays dying out? I don't think it's dying out. It's just seen less frequently, you know. Which, in my opinion, is and and I'm strong. I've a strong opinion on this. Is so when you have a winger who's brave enough, they they still attack fullbacks and 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 get to the byline and and put it in the box or you know maybe go at two or three men. I think it needs to be, you know, polished up and, and, and kept around the team because, you know, you're not seeing it that often now. The players aren't playing in the street as often. Uh, you know, I, I can only speak for myself, but, you know, my, my balance and dribbling ability came from playing in the street against older players on gravel pitches, you know, because the last thing you wanted to do is get close enough to one of the bigger lads that he could throw you on the gravel and, cut your elbow and you know so i was always ducking and diving and weaving and, and making sure there was very difficult to you know get near and when i went on to the pitch then you know I, I i that was the only way i knew how to play so you know my my football skills and balance were purely purely learned on the streets the difference you have now is you have a lot more structured coaching sessions you know, so players are getting coached from eight, nine year old, told this is what you should do, told this is what you shouldn't do, and every mistake's being corrected. That's not how you coach a young kid. Mm -hmm. You should let young kids make mistakes, make them make loads of mistakes, and try and let them work it out for themselves. You know, if you see them continuously doing the same thing wrong, you have a quiet word and say, look, maybe that's not working. Why don't you try this? Or in this area of the pitch, why don't you pass the ball? You might get it back higher up. Then your time to dribble. So, you know, I do agree, Stephen. You're seeing it a lot less, but I don't think it's completely dying out. And I, and I still do believe that there's room for players of that up within teams. Jumping in on there, it's like who do you, who's the wingers you like at the minute in the modern game? Like, doesn't have to be local. Like, whatever is a is a wingers you think still still producing that kind of quality. Well, there's obviously, like, you've obviously got the, the top ones in the Premier League, you know, with uh, Bakayo Saka, Phil Foden. You can see their street football in Emmons, you know. They're both small in stature, but they're, they're quick, they're nimble. They're very rarely in, in battles and, and sort of physical duels because they've learned over the years that that's not what they want to be in. They want to be elusive. They want to be hardy. You know, they want to be hardy marked. You have the likes of Salah, who is just, you know, based purely on pace. So look, the, the modern wingers now are, you know, probably a mixture of being very, very physically incredible in terms of their pace and power, but also have the ability to go by a man in a one-on-one -on -one situation. And, you know, you can see now the, the very, very top ones, how sought after they are and the money, what clubs are willing to pay them, you know. Well, I think we're pretty much out of time, unfortunately, Paddy. Uh, just looking at these pictures here must bring back some good memories. Uh, congratulations uh, on your career, and thanks for giving us all these wonderful times. No, listen, yeah, the whole the whole five years was a was an absolute honour, you know, to represent the club, and you know, never one day of the whole five years that I take for granted, and. You know, I'm going back over now in a few weeks they they do a few uh, Q and A's and that's on I always enjoy. So, you know, looking forward to getting back over and, and seeing some of the supporters and you know, always brings the memories back, you know, touching down in Glasgow. So it'll be good to get across. Well, I'm sure that'll be a fantastic night. So on behalf of everyone here, thanks a lot, Patty, for doing this. Not a problem. Listen, keep in touch, Gavin. You know, I can jump on again another time and have more time if there's any questions that you've You've left got a whole bunch there. of questions we never got to, so absolutely. Well, sure keep in touch with the email and we'll jump on again in a few weeks, definitely. Fabulous. All right. Cheers, buddy. Okay. Well, thanks, 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 lads. Thanks, mate. Speak to you soon. Cheers. Cheers. All the best. All right.